Hello, I'm Stefan Kreber, project leader for LexD, and today I'd like to talk about security. Uh, that's not necessarily the most exciting topic uh, for everyone, but it's something that we do need to go to go through, and that if you're considering LexD at any kind of scale, I'm sure you've been wondering about and might have questions about. Um, there are a few different aspects to security when it comes to, to LexD. We're going to be going through, through those. Um, the main three aspects that I'd like to cover are the project security. So what kind of what's the what's the our security policy? Kind of general standing in the security community. How do we handle to uh, security issues being reported? That kind of stuff. Then you've got the host security side of things. Uh, so you've got Lexi running on a system. How safe is it? Uh, what do you need to to be careful about? Uh, how about like how safe is it? a container actually? Um, what kind of attacks do you need to keep in mind? What do you need to do there? Um, and then there's the API security. LexD is a daemon exposing a REST API. Um, what happens if you expose that to the outside world? What happens uh, if someone has access to that API? What can they do? This kind of stuff. So that's the main topics I'd like to cover. And we're going to start with the project security. So here I've got the security page in our documentation open. Uh, it, it covers a lot of the aspects that are going to be covered in this demo, in this uh, video. Um, but specifically in this case, it links to our uh, security policy, which is on GitHub and can be found here. So basically it states that LexD has uh, two type of releases, monthly feature releases, LTS releases. The monthly feature releases are supported up until the next one comes out. Uh, LTS releases have a five-year support period uh, for security and about two years for bug fixes. Uh, it defines what we consider to be security issues. There are some more details under the LXC page, uh, especially for containers. We don't consider, for example, escaping a privileged container to be a security issue because we don't consider those containers to be safe in the first place. So there are some restrictions like that. Um, but in general, we do have a mailing list. Uh, there are lists of uh, people you can con contact and we all have uh, GPG so you can easily encrypt um, any email that you're for security disclosure to us. After that what happens is that we, we run it effectively using a normal de, de facto process for open source project security disclosure so if it affects other projects we need to synchronize with all other projects to figure out what our response is as far as like when a bug fix uh, can be prepared. All of that happens privately. We don't want, obviously, work on a security bug fix to happen in public if if the issue has not been publicly disclosed yet. Um, then we work with both the reporter and any other affected projects and distributions to set a coordinated uh, release date um, for the for the um, for the bug fix, which is a date and time that everyone agrees they will be releasing their fixes at. Um, this is pretty convenient, that just avoids anyone kind of jumping the guns uh, and it also means that after that date we can talk publicly about the issue. Um, so that's why it also involves the initial reporter because the whoever reports the issue probably doesn't want us to just sit on it for like two or three years. So most commonly we're looking at like some anywhere from like one to three months. It can go up to six months for very complex issues also impacting the kernel and a bunch of other distros and clouds and that kind of stuff. But usually it's reasonably quick. Um, and yeah, at that point we issue, so uh, either the reporter, if they've got access to that, or us through either ourselves or our distribution will we'll get a CV number assigned. Um, so there are multiple ways to get a CV number assigned these days. Like in our case, we can go through Ubuntu directly to get one that way, or we can make a direct request to uh, Nest to get one, which is what we've done the past couple of times, I think, for Alexi. That works pretty well. We get a CV number assigned. That makes it easy for tracking. Everyone who then releases the security fix will refer to that number, and that makes it nice and easy for everyone to make sure the systems are all patched. So yeah, that's pretty much how it works on our side. One thing that's probably worth mentioning is that uh, LexD um, does not have any kind of paid bug bounty or any of that kind of stuff. Um, Canonical in general doesn't participate in those programs at this point, so we don't have any of that. That might change in the future, but currently uh, everything is just unpaid. We treat them as 
got virtual bugs uh, through that mailing list and coordinate everything that way, coordinate with the other Linux distributions as needed. All right, so that mostly takes care of the um, kind of project security. Uh, I don't have exact numbers. I know with over the life of Flexi so far, we've ma maybe had a two or three, I think, security issues that were considered to be worth getting a CV assigned and getting going through the, the whole process. Um, but yeah, in general, we're also uh, definitely in the camp of like, you know, uh, having a CV assigned to you is not a bad thing. Uh, there, there are some people that seem to be extremely like seeing that as poor quality um, to, to have people report security issues and getting public CV and numbers and everything assigned. And I think that's the, the wrong approach in general. Like you want to make sure that the software you're using um, is responsive, that they're pretty good at fixing security issues, that they're also looking at the kind of security issues that they have had in the past to see whether it was poor design or whether it was just like some kind of effectively unavoidable bug that was pretty well hidden. Um, and your projects being generally open and engaging with the community is really what you want to see instead of people trying to hide things under a rug. So um, yeah, that's for the project security on our side. Now, uh, oh, I guess another thing we can mention is that uh, those those three names for the security contacts, all three of us are quite involved, not only in LXD security, but we're also uh, the ones running LXC security. And we are all uh, quite often involved in kernel security as well. So pretty often if you find something that you feel is a security issue, uh, feel free to email us even if it's not directly LXD related or LXC related, because chances are we know very well the person who is actually in charge of whatever the issue is. Um, Christian and myself uh, are pretty frequent speaker at the Linux Security Summit, so we're quite active in the Linux security community. Um, and we, yeah, we, we know just about everyone there and we're we're pretty good at coordinating amongst amongst ourselves whenever something happens. All right, so moving on. Uh, next aspect would be host security. So for that, the most common question is really, um, you know, how safe are containers? Um, are you better off using virtual machines? Which one is safest? And as, as pretty often in our field, uh, the answer is going to be it depends. Uh, containers can be extremely unsafe. If you're looking at containers that are like fully privileged, where root in a container is fully root on the system, those are not safe at all. Um, and you can do a tremendous amount of damage to the host, you can escape, you can attack other containers, you can do persistent attack against the hardware. It can be extremely nasty. Um, but at the same time, a very well configured unprivileged container uh, with a dedicated user namespace, no overlapping UIDs or GIDs, an up-to-date kernel, uh, live patching enabled, and um, a decent Apalmer and SecCom profile can be just as safe, if not safer than virtual machines in some cases. Like, especially as we've seen a lot more attacks uh, going on around CPU virtualization especially. Um, it's it's a bit of a toss these days which one might be safest. Uh, there's There's been attacks against containers in the kernel for sure. Uh, there's been attacks against hypervisors and virtual devices as well. So it really depends. Um, in many environments, people who really, um, really care deeply about security tend to go with both. So you run a properly configured and privileged containers inside of a virtual machine with very, very few virtual devices attached to it. And that combination gets you kind of the best of both worlds because, well, if either of the layers has an issue, the chance that the other one also has one at the same time is pretty darn low. Um, so that's definitely been an approach. That's kind of what Google's been doing with Chromebooks, where LexD runs inside of a very thin VM. And it was effectively for that reason. Like they, they didn't want to run containers directly on the base system because that would be pretty unsafe in their view, uh, especially on a system that's as restricted as a Chromebook. And running just a virtual machine was also not flexible enough and not safe enough. Um, so they ended up using both. So that's definitely an approach. Now, outside of that, just looking at containers specifically, um, well, there are three kinds of containers. You've got unprivileged. Well, no, there's two kinds of containers, unprivileged and privileged. But then for unprivileged containers, you can configure them in some different ways. So in LexD, we effectively treat things as, as if there's three classes of containers for us. 
you've got a default Lexi container, which is unprivileged. It uses the user namespace, it's pretty safe. But it does not prevent some attacks around denial of, of service, for example, because it doesn't uh, use a distinct set of UIDs and GIDs for every single container. This can be done by turning on isolated mode in NextD, it's a security option, which at that point makes sure every single one of your container has a completely unique range of UIDs and GIDs. Um, so that's kind of those two. And then you've got the very big hammer that hopefully pretty much nobody needs to ever use, which is security privileged, which then runs the container uh, without the user namespace. So much more similar to your default um, Docker type container. And this means the, well, there's no UID or GID mapping. So if you get to root inside a container and you manage to escape your real root on the whole system, uh, any use of privileged containers on the system effectively disqualifies you for anything related to security as far as XD is concerned, because we consider those containers to not be root safe. And so anyone, if you run anything untrusted in one of those containers, it's, and something happens to your host, well, yeah, we, it's kind of expected. Um, we do try to put as many safety nets as we can around that. So we will be using SecComp and AppArmor and a bunch of those uh, technologies by default to block any known issue with privileged containers. But it's just that, it's just blocking the stuff we know. It's not blocking any of the other stuff. And there's a lot that you could try and attack. Uh, and privileged containers instead kind of work the other way around where because they're using the user namespace, effectively everything is blocked by default. You don't have more privilege than a normal user unless things were configured to give you more privileged. Um, and that's why LexD supports a lot of different options like Cisco interception and those kind of mechanisms to give you more privilege than a normal user while also like not requiring a fully privileged container effectively. All right, so that's enough talking on that point. I'm just going to be switching to a terminal and we'll just look at those three container types real quick. Um, so let's just do a stock Ubuntu 20.04 container, call it U1. I don't actually remember if I initialized that text D at all. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I did not. Okay, so I downloaded the image, but there was nothing. Uh, but text itself was not initialized. Okay, so now we've got storage and network. There we go. So that's one container running. And if we look at the process list, we're going to see that root in the container looks like UID 1 million on the host. So that is your normal unprivileged container in NextD. That's what you get by default. If you launch a second one, you're going to notice that they both use 1 million. OK, so that's what I was saying, where now if there's some kind of kernel API or something you can make use of from within that container to apply a limit to that specific user, it will cross container boundary and can affect other containers. So that's not ideal from a uh, denial of service really point of view. You can still restrict resources of those containers with limits that will work just fine. Um, but there's some potential attacks around that. So for those cases, there is the option to do security ID map isolated true. And we'll see that it runs as a completely different user now. So U3 runs as um, 1,600, uh, well, 1,065,536. Now, if we launch another one, we should see a different offset. There we go. So yeah, those containers don't have any overlap uh, that kind of prevents them from attacking each other. The one thing to keep in mind though is that those that are not isolated have access to all of the UIDs after, well, to about a billion UIDs, which does get them technically access to the UIDs and GIDs of those isolated containers. That's all to say that if you're using isolated, con um, isolated containers, you should use it for all of your containers, not just for a subset. Uh, you should really use it for all of them on the system. All right, and now then let's look at the scary kind. So if I do U5 and call it security privileged, true, then we'll see immediately what the problem is with those. There we go. So it's another container runs the same set of processes. But here you're, notice, you're noticing that instead of seeing UID 1 million something for something that should run as root, you see actual root. So yeah, that means that processes running as root inside that, of that container runs as the actual root. They still run within a namespace. They still run with their own file system and stuff. Sure. But 
if they can get their hands on some specific files in slash proc or slash sys that let's say, you know, lets you configure, I don't know, um, if you have an up call, so a, a file that lets you say, if this event happen, happens, call this particular path on the system. Uh, one such example would be the call dump handler, which is called every time some processes crashes. Uh, that sets a command that is then run as real root on the system outside of the container. So if you can get access to any of those kind of files, then you can pretty easily engineer your way out of the container, at which point you get full root access to the entire system and it's game over. Uh, as I said, we use AppArmor and SecCom to block as many of those that we're aware of, um, but this is not foolproof and you should really only ever use privileged containers on your own system when you're in charge of everything running in that container and you're, you're fine with that. Otherwise, never give that to someone you don't, you wouldn't trust with root access to the entire system. All right, so that's the basic uh, of container security. Um, just cleaning things up here and let's just move back. So the the last aspect to, to cover as far as security really is uh, API security. So it is covered here with access to the Lexi daemon, which kind of uh, covers that topic. Basically, if you have normal access to LexD, so if you're in the LexD group on most systems, you are just as, I mean, you've got root access to the system effectively. Um, that's because an unrestricted access to LexD allows you to create a container or even a VM that can then be passed raw block device. So say your entire, entire hard disk or be passed raw character device, say your device that lets you control your firmware. Um, or past any path on the host system. And from that, it's very easy again to modify some system files on the host and then you get full root access even if all you're using is in a privileged container. So effectively, if you're in the LexD group or if you've got unrestricted access to the LexD API through some other means, you have full control over the system. And you should keep that in mind before you add anyone to that group or you give anyone full access to LexD. This is not a unique thing to LexD. The exact same thing is true if you get access to the Docker socket, or it's the exact same, exact same thing is true if you get access to the libvirt socket. It's a pretty common pattern with virtualization software that they are very flexible, they let you create storage, network, and pass whatever you want inside instances. That comes at the cost of effectively being able to do whatever you want on the system. Now, that's not to say that there's no way noise around that in LexD. Um, LexD lets you uh, create projects. Projects can be restricted to make them safe. Um, and then you can create specific tokens for users that are restricted to specific projects. Uh, there's a separate video for that, uh, that that's been live for a little bit now. Uh, but just the basics would be you create a new project called, say, Untrusted, and then set on unstressed untrusted, uh, restricted, true, okay. And then you would do um, config trust add untrusted user, projects untrusted and restricted. Um, oops, this should have been dash dash name. And we just need to have LexD itself listen on the network. So you do that this way. And here we go. So now if I'm going as a random user and I want to consume that token, so just do Argos and this token. Okay. And I look at what's running on Argos, I see nothing, that's fine. I uh, just need to initialize that project a tiny bit. Uh, let's copy the default profile from the default project over to the default profile inside of um, or they are quite untrusted. Okay. Now, if as that untrusted user, I want to launch a container, that works just fine. I've got a container running. Cool. Now, if I want to do the same thing, but with a privileged container, it's forbidden. 
And similarly, uh, you will be, it's going to be forbidden to add disk devices, to add a uh, raw block device, raw character device, raw USB devices. Just about everything that we know has a way to, to let you escape um, is just going to be denied. Same thing that user is not allowed to modify global resources. So the user cannot see the actual configuration of the server. Um, as we can see, that's the actual config looks like that. It's called core HTTPS address, but what the user sees it says it as empty. It is not allowed to change anything. So even a basic key. Um, oops. Uh, whoopsie. Ah, oh, interesting. I wanted to fix that one. Uh, it's because the, the map is null instead of being empty. So I need to just fix that. But effectively, the user doesn't have any right to modify <laughs> configuration. Um, so if we do a list of storage, for example, on Argos, and we wanted to do create blah, the first not authorized. So that user is only allowed to interact with their project with all the restrictions applied. And you could even apply resource limits to that project to make it much, much safer. So that is one way to, to make things safe. Don't give full uh, legacy group access to, to users. Give them specific tokens. They connect over the REST API. They authenticate that way, and they get tied to a specific restricted project, and that's much, much safer. On the local system, there's also, and that's, again, covered in the other video, but um, there is the, the option to create projects dynamically. So if you do snap set lexd and that is daemon.user.group, I believe. Um, and we set that to users. And then we add a user called foo. And we put that user in the users group. When that user tries to interact with lexd, lexd will automatically generate a new project for the user here. We can see user restricted project for foo, UID 1001. And if you go look at what we have here, that user is quite heavily restricted. So restriction is enabled, nesting is allowed. Uh, they're allowed to pass in disk so long as it's within the home directory. They're allowed GPU access, but not anything else. And uh, they are allowed to use of their own UID and GID for pass through inside of instances, but nothing else. And that again means they just get to launch instances if they want to. And that works just fine. But similarly, they will not be allowed to do anything that is bad, like using a previous container. So that's, that's another way to, to run things safely. Uh, in a multi-user environment on your system, you can totally do that. As an administrator, you can turn that on and the new users can use LexD and they can't um, take over the system through it. The, the other way to, to handle API security in LexD uh, would be with uh, Canonical RBAC. So that's a paid, it's a paid service uh, for Canonical customers where you get to centrally manage user and groups and what access to what project and what permission level you get to specific projects. For the bulk of, of normal local users that are not managing like large sets of LexD servers, mm -hmm. using what I showed here, which is the TLS certificate, works perfectly fine. Um, we're also looking at expanding some of our uh, centralized authentication mechanism with OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 in the, in, in the months to year to come. And that's pretty much it for the API security. So just yeah, the, the short version of it is treat the LexD group or access to the LexD uh, Unix socket or API as being the same as giving root access to the system. Uh, if you if you want to give access to other folks to LexD, try to use projects with restrictions enabled. Uh, if it needs to be local, then use the LexD multi-user uh, that I just showed here, but also has a dedicated video on it. Just, yeah, be careful. Uh, understand what, what you're doing, what you want to run. In many, many cases, like if it's your own code running inside of the container, you don't have to care too much. Uh, same deal with virtual machines. Also, don't assume that virtual machines are necessarily safer than containers in this context. Uh, LexD still lets you do pass through to virtual machines. And so if the user can still pass through the entire host disk to a VM, they can still do a lot of harm. So you still want a restricted project, even in that case. Uh, so that's the, they're not allowed to do that to their virtual machines. All right. Well, I hope this was a useful 
look at Lexity security. Again, we do have the data security page in our documentation that goes through a bunch of different aspects I covered here. So it includes things like our uh, support model, list the link to the security policy, some details on accessing the, the Lexity daemon. There's some uh, aspect here on container security, mentioning the isolated flag I showed, um, also explaining the, the risk for denial of service attacks. Some tweaks you can do to your host if you want to prevent uh, potential information leakage. Uh, that's an aspect I don't really cover here, but um, this can be quite important for some. If you don't want containers to be able to see other containers' names, there are a couple of things you can do around that. And then uh, covering how you can handle things on the network side of it, because that's the other aspect where containers could, in theory, try to attack each other. Um, there are a few different options there that, uh, that you might want to consider as well. All right. If you've got any questions around any of this, uh, leave them down below, or you can go in our community forum. If you do have security issues, please don't file them publicly. Uh, send them to our security list instead, uh, so we can properly handle them, uh, properly set a release date, and communicate with our partners and other, other projects so that everything goes as smoothly as possible. And that's it for this one. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.